Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to the weekly podcast under the macroscope. Uh, we've given our regular guest, uh, Skybound Capital's chief strategist, Jabir Sadawala, another week off. It's a bank holiday weekend in the UK, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome William Bossoff to this week's podcast, who is Skybound Capital's expert in cybersecurity and therefore cybercrime. And why do we think this is such an important podcast issue? It, it is a macro issue. It's affecting economies. It's affecting companies all over the planet. And especially in the last uh, 16 to 18 months, as so much of what we've done in the workplace has been done in an online or digital world. It has opened up a whole new world of opportunity for cyber criminals. So cyber security really is a very important and hot topic at the moment and will be going forward. So William, welcome to Under the Macroscope. We look forward to hearing some of your views on the most uh, pertinent issues in the space. And first of all, what do you see as having been the recent global economic impact of cybercrime? Well, you know, Matt, it's very interesting that just in the last week, there's been two real major uh, headlines that I think is worth paying attention to. The first being the colonial pipeline in the US, which has been taken to a halt due to ransomware, which ransomware is a very specific type of, of malware, which sole purpose is to lock up and encrypt a victim's data and thereby rendering the systems unusable. And the same goes for the Irish Health Service here in the UK, which has undergone a similar uh, attack, which has, of course, you know, far-reaching consequences. And what do you think is the incentive uh, driving the increased prevalence of these malware and ransomware attacks, and indeed any form of uh, cybercrime? Mm -hmm. You know, it's very interesting is that there's no doubt that the prevalence and the impact of these incidents are on the increase, but the extent remains unclear because a lot of these incidents aren't reported. You can imagine the, the sort of embarrassment that a company might want to uh, save itself from if it uh, was targeted by one of these attacks. But the economic incentive from, a, from a, an attacker, from a perpetrator side, is that these groups have devised a new revenue stream uh, which is basically a, a revenue sharing scheme, if you can think of it that way, where the more sophisticated hackers would create the software and would almost lease it to less skilled hackers whose only real purpose is then to try and carry out this attack and infect target systems. And an interesting uh, development recently is that these groups have taken it a step further and not just holding companies ransom, but also before making it publicly known that they have compromised the target, they would tip off uh, their close network of brokers so the brokers can then short the stock before this news uh, comes out. So you, you really see that this is you know, a pinnacle example of organized crime, combined with the fact that it's such a low risk endeavor because it's so difficult and costly to track down and prosecute the perpetrators. You raise an interesting point there. I mean, it is highly skilled, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's highly organized mm -hmm. and uh, hence uh, the difficulty with dealing with it. Absolutely. It's, uh, it, it really is almost a FTSE 500 type of company that, that uh, these organizations make com comprise of. Uh, and at Skybound Capital, William, we, we get to, to work with you uh, on a daily basis. I mean, mm -hmm. For those who are listening into the podcast, I mean, it really is a case of you mm -hmm. having to think like a cyber criminal. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's you know, I, uh, I appreciate where they, it, it's no mystery to me why somebody would, would uh, turn to these sort of uh, crimes. Um, and the real, the real reason is, is that it's, you know, given the economic uncertainties out there, and given how profitable it is, how low risk it is, if you don't have any sort of an internal moral compass to keep you on the straight and narrow, then it would be a very attractive uh, uh, preoccupation. And, and I guess as well, I mentioned in the intro that uh, 
so many companies, ours included, mm -hmm. jumped into this new way of working mm -hmm. uh, out of necessity. Things mm -hmm. had to get done. Mm -hmm. And a lot more people did and continue to work from home, which in itself uh, mm -hmm. poses a whole new uh, basket of, of threats, if you like, uh, and, and opportunities for cyber criminals. You know, the, the interesting, you make a very interesting point there is that the, the, the risk associated with remote work is it's not... It's a bit counterintuitive because it's not obvious that the problem is with technology itself. The sort of a compromises that we've seen have largely been as a result of internal policies and procedures, checks and balances, falling by the wayside and not being replaced with um, sane alternatives. And it's that breakdown in communication that a lot of these attackers are taking advantage of. But that should be good news because it really... Uh, it really shows us that significant and meaningful progress can be made at an individual level. So on that point, William, mm -hmm. how can an individual mm -hmm. uh, contend with the macro level challenges posed mm -hmm. by cybercrime? Well, the, I think the real bottom line is, is that we need to have a look at, uh, consider those that are most affected. And currently the, the most vulnerable are unfortunately children and more on an economic aspect, elderly. The vast majority of successful ransomware attacks and extortions lay within the older percentage of the population. So if you were to ask how to contend with that, I think that I would urge anybody to really become the, or take the responsibility for their family and educate your loved ones and, and really prioritize digital safety um, of your family as a priority. And the, the, there's two ways that I would approach this is that number one, use a password manager. It makes having complex, difficult to compromise passwords an absolute breeze. It is simply put a much more sophisticated way of storing passwords as opposed to writing them down or reusing them, which is often a flaw that's taken advantage of. And secondly, when it comes to personal email, make sure that you turn on two-factor authentication. This is simply the sort of an OTP equivalent that you have for online banking. That is a feature that you can enable for free on most personal email platforms. If you do just those two things for you and your loved ones, then you really put yourself ahead of the pack by a large margin. And, and William, at a practical level, mm -hmm. uh, it's impossible to go through all the examples, mm -hmm. but what sort of things should people be on the lookout for? What, what screams uh, mm -hmm. at you uh, in your line of work, this is wrong. There's, there's something uh, definitely uh, problematic with this particular piece of communication, this mm -hmm. email, this mm -hmm. request for information, whatever it may be. What are, what are some of the clear signs that something mm -hmm. is awry? You know, hackers are all about exploiting vulnerabilities. And as human beings, we have our own inherent built-in vulnerabilities. So for example, if I were to try and elicit you to do something which is against your, your uh, better judgment, then I would use certain words and phrases to pressure you into taking action without thinking through the potential consequences, such as using the words urgent, um, you know, uh, SARS rebate, um, some sort of, uh, you know, visa being revoked email, all these sorts of things that really uh, put people into a state of fear. And as soon as, as, as an attacker can put you on the back foot in that regard, then they know that your thinking is going to be clouded. And that's, that's the number one thing. When you receive an email, take a deep breath, read it over, and then decide how to act. And it's highly likely that those uh, regular notices that you've won a, a lot of money in, mm -hmm. in a lottery somewhere, unlikely to be true. <laughs> Well, that's another one, you know, that that's really also just exploiting the other side of the coin of fear is that people want to be financially independent and you're, you're, you're playing on that, that, that narrative where 
you know, this communication can be life-changing. Let me act now. Let me push that button and redeem this voucher. Let me claim my prize. William, we've spoken about the sophistication of this world, and, and that in itself tells you that, that, that it really is a business. It, it might not be a business that uh, the vast majority of us ascribe to or, or agree with, but that is the nature of any crime. And uh, there have been many crime syndicates long mm -hmm. before the days of cybercrime. So I guess the obvious question for you is where, where is this going? What, what do you see in your world in the immediate and medium term future? Well, there's, there's, there's two main things that I would say is, is really worth considering. And that is the fact that currently, as I speak, there's only 4.6 billion active internet users, which is just shy of 60% of the world's population. That is set to increase drastically in the, in the coming few years. So you're going to have an enormous amount of new people being exposed to challenges, which even those of us who have been online for as long as we have are, are struggling with. So there's going to be more people that, that's vulnerable and susceptible to these challenges. So that's number one. Number two is, is that I can foresee that it would likely become illegal for companies to pay a ransom to these organizations in order to release their data. Um, I think that we are, we've already seen that in the US where, you know, the motto, we don't negotiate with terrorists is, is almost a hallmark of any good action movie. But, um, you know, the, the result will almost certainly be a horrific game of chicken in the short term. But ultimately, I think it's the right decision in the long run. Because as long as we incentivize this sort of organizational crime syndicate, it will continue to, to operate. Well, it is a space that we owe it to ourselves, our clients, our families, as you mentioned, to, to stay very close to and to be constantly aware. Sad as it might seem, we have to be vigilant uh, in, in this relatively new uh, area of crime. So we feel very reassured that you are firmly ensconced in our team and that you are constantly trying to second guess. But as always, great to hear your views uh, and uh, to reassure people that uh, you have this area of our business uh, under your microscope. And uh, great to be able to catch up with you on our podcast this afternoon. Uh, don't forget that Under the Macroscope is available on uh, Apple, on Spotify, on the Google podcast platform for Android, and all our past podcasts are available at Skybound Capital's website at skyboundcapital.com. Until next time on Under the Macroscope, where we will be saying a warm welcome back to Jabir Sadawala. Have a great week.